we are the people who we're looking for. It's us. There's no one else coming. We have to be the ones who are going to step up into those positions of leadership instead of just counting on other people to fill that. It's us. If we don't, who else is? And so I would just encourage people to remember to take the initiative, go be your best self, be who you are, be that well and thrive because of who you are, not despite it and not for what other people tell you you're supposed to be. Have you ever noticed that some of the best ideas come from unexpected places? Your next breakthrough may come from a leader facing similar challenges, but in a completely different sector. Welcome to Chief Influencer. I'm your host, Anthony Shop. Join us as we explore how today's successful leaders inspire, influence, and connect with others. Chief Influencer is a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board, who have teamed up to spotlight how great leaders and communicators are making their impact in the world. This episode is brought to you by the George Washington University's College of Professional Studies, with in-person and online programs, ranging from master's degrees in public relations strategy to certificate programs in digital communications. GW offers more than just the credentials to help working professionals get ahead. It prepares them to be leaders in their field. As a proud GW graduate myself, I can attest that faculty members combine academic rigor with real world lessons that can't always be found in textbooks. Check out cps.gwu.edu for more information. We have a very special episode of Chief Influencer. We wanted to resurface our interview with Danica Rome. Um, she was a delegate to the State House in Virginia when we interviewed her, and just earlier this month was elected to the State Senate in Virginia, breaking more barriers. So we invite you to listen to an encore presentation of our interview with Danica Rome. Well, I'm so excited to introduce today's guest, Danica Rome. Danica is a stepmom, a heavy metal vocalist, a vegetarian, an award-winning journalist, and best-selling author. But she is best known as the United States' first openly transgender state legislator. First, but no longer only, I should add. In 2017, Danica was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates, defeating an incumbent who proudly called himself Virginia's chief homophobe. While many doubted her ability to win, she was elected and then re-elected twice more. Danica is now a candidate for Virginia's state Senate. I'm really excited to dive into her career and her strategies as a chief influencer. Danica, congratulations on being recognized by the Communications Board as a chief influencer, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's great to see you. You too. I wanted to start by asking, we believe some of the most effective leaders are more than chief executives. They are chief influencers. As a journalist turned elected official, can you tell us, who do you have to influence to achieve the impact that you want to see in the world? Well, first, I need to be influenced by and I need to then summarily uh, re-influence my constituents. That's number that is number one, which is that I have to know what's important to them and then execute the issues that are important to them. So, you know, from a lifetime of living here in Western Prince William County, from being a reporter here for nine years, two months and two weeks from 2006 to 2015. Um, and from the last six years, having served this area, you know, as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates, you know, I've got a really good understanding of what it is, you know, that are, you know, very important issues on a macro level throughout West Prince William, as well as the two cities uh, from an and Spark. But when it comes to the micro, I'm not going to know every single thing about every single one of the 101,000 people I represent. I you know, it, that's literally impossible. So how do you get to know what's really going to be important like that, right? Well, you got to go knock doors and you got to go listen and you got to go talk to people and you got to go out. And when you hear them, for example, when I was first running for office in 2017, I didn't know that reforming the adult guardianship system in Virginia was going to become one of my chief issues that I end up working on, you know, in the House of Delegates. But because one of my constituents talked to me about an issue that was very personal to her that would result in uh, her sister dying due to, you know, terrible care or lack thereof, I would, I would even argue intentionally malicious care that I want to go do something about it. And so in that case, the influence to me was, here's why you should care about this issue. And I was influenced on it because I have a set of values about protecting the most vulnerable people. 
And there is no form of person who is more vulnerable in society than incapacitated adults. Incapacitated adults don't have access to their rights. Someone else controls that for them. And so they are always at the mercy of other people making right decisions for them. And I want to go do something about it. So all three terms have been in office. I have filed legislation about reforming the adult guardianship system. And um, this year, we finally got a lot of that done. We got major reforms done where we're requiring uh, guardians to now have to actually visit their wards uh, three times a year, once in person, once in person or virtual, once in person or virtual or by designee. And I wanted four. I wanted four in-person visits. Uh, we had to compromise to get where we were. But, you know, it's it's a step, right? And one of the other bills that we did with this um, ended up allowing uh, family members to have more rights to visit um, their loved ones who are, you know, incapacitated. And it, like, so it, there's a whole thing that goes with that. And we also made sure that we had equal lengths of terms on the uh, basically adult guardianship advisory board uh, that deals with this in the first place so that there's a lot more consistency there. Um, but long and short of it is it wasn't just me doing this we i also managed to influence a number of my colleagues to carry similar uh you know or to carry legislation on the same topic um and the the reason that's important is because my my legislative portfolio can't just be one topic i can't just have you know like 15 bills on this one thing you know i've got to have help from other colleagues because look you know reforming the you know adult guardianship system in virginia that doesn't just affect you know people in Western Prince William and Manassas Park. It affects people all throughout Virginia, and so you need to have a lot of different voices, a lot of different experiences. And so, when uh, Jackie Glass won her special election uh, the night before we were all sworn in in uh, 2022, I gave her one of my bills to carry for uh, uh, for reforming the guardianship system, and she got it passed. It was one of her first bills she to get passed, which was awesome. You know, when Delegate Sally Hudson, she got a bill passed. You know, on this topic, and we've had other bills passed from other members on this topic in the last few years too. All of this is really important, and it was nothing that I brought to the table when I launched my campaign in 2017, but I was influenced by my constituents to do it, and since then. I've, you know, influenced my colleagues to support this legislation through battling for it for six years. And I've support and I've influenced my colleagues to carry legislation about this as well, because it's also important um, uh, for them. So, and, you know, I've had a good partner with uh, Senator Jeremy Pike in this as well, too, by the way. So just long and short of everything is influence is a is more of a roundabout than a, you know, than a two-way you know, street. It, there's a lot of different you know, angles in which people can kind of come at it. And, you know, at some point, you're all just going to kind of meet in that middle right there, right? And uh, hopefully, um, you know, when you are doing this job, and you do it well, everyone works in good faith, then you have a predictable way to get on the other side, um, and be a better legislator for it. If people don't work in good faith, though, then the influence that they have on you is actually negative on in terms of their own reputation. And so they can have a bad influence on you in terms of your perception about them. I know that's a lot to digest, but it's really important to act in good faith this way that the influence that you choose to exert and that you choose to be influenced by, you know, is coming from a good place. But if it's not coming from a good place and someone tries to influence you to do the wrong thing, people are going to catch on. I love how you used uh, roundabout, a traffic transportation analogy, because uh, when you first ran for office in 2017, obviously there was a major national, regional, local narrative about um, your candidacy and you know eventual win making history. But when you were focused locally on connecting with your constituents, you really focused on a lot of local issues like, um, you know, I think it was Route 28 in particular. Can you talk a little bit about that and sort of the, the messaging discipline and the focus that you had when you ran your first race? Sure. So, you know, um, when I was asked to run for all of this, uh, you know, the year before, I knew immediately what I would campaign on, which was fixing Route 28. You know, it was because of my mom's community. My mom had, by the time my mom retired, she spent 40 years driving up and down Route 28 to get to from uh, our home at Manassas 
to get to her job near Dulles International Airport. And I remember being in school and at sixth grade at All Saints Catholic School in Manassas, went until 6 30, 7 o'clock at night for my mom to come pick me up. Um, sometimes because, you know, she was battling it all in 28. And, you know, my predecessor had been in office since I was seven years old. And by the time I ran for office, Nothing had changed about Route 28 since the mid-1980s uh, between Yorkshire and Centerville. And so I ran to go change it. And now, as I speak right now, uh, I voted for the construction when I was a member of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. I voted for the construction that's underway right now in Centerville uh, for the multimodal six laning that's happening. I also uh, secured $24.5 million, $24.47 million uh, uh, from the Virginia Highway Safety Improvement Program and another uh, $330,000 from RSTP funds, Regional Surface Transportation Project funds, and uh, program funds. And that money is going to go to uh, implementing my innovative design, uh, intersection designs uh, study that we did, my STAR study, for a series of R cuts, which are restricted crossing U turns, a raised median, and 1.75 miles of contiguous sidewalks. So people have an alternative to having to drive 28 in the first place. And that will be between Manassas Park and Yorkshire. Now, I nerd out knowing fully well that your audience did not tune in for a uh, in-depth discussion about, you know, uh, modern roundabouts. And uh, like we're going to have over in Rollins Ford Road, we're at $8.9 million for between Gainesville and Bristow. Um, and nor did they tune in for innovative intersection design talk on, you know, 28. But I mentioned all of that because I took my real life experience, my mom's commute, and I've driven that road hundreds, if not thousands of times, you know, just probably, yeah, probably thousands of times at this point in my life. You know, I've been driving for 23 years now. I was on 28 today. You know, it's just, that's just, that's just part of life for being here. Um, and so I wanted to really kind of emphasize with this of having that lived experience. It was just like, I was positive that if I went door to door and talked to people about 28, everyone would have a route 28 horror story and they did. And so, you know, what I also heard was, Danica, don't run on transportation as your chop issue because voters are too jaded about it in Northern Virginia to want to believe that anyone's going to actually do anything. I said, and that's exactly why I should be running on it. That's exactly why I should be prioritizing this because every other politician right now, it seems like is kicking the can on this and trying to, you know, blame someone else or say it was someone else's, you know, uh, job. And my predecessor proved me right in the 2017 campaign when he uh, had a sign that said um, supervisors, not slogans, fix route 28, where he was trying to assign responsibility to the Prince William Board of County Supervisors for it. And I called BS and I said, no, 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 this is a state maintained road. And yes, the county can help at the same time. This is your job. This is your job. You're, you are the state delegate for this area, your job. You've been in office for 26 years. You care more about where I go to the bathroom than how your constituents get to work. You need to be fired and be replaced by someone who's going to prioritize this. And well, my constituents agreed. <laughs> and so here I am, you know, and now running for state Senate and got a pretty good shot this fall, you know, so everything goes well. And, um, you know, we're going to just continue focusing like a laser on fixing Route 28. That's what we're doing. So I loved your book burn the page. It is um, such a high energy and entertaining memoir about your life and your experience. And I actually listened to it, which I'm so glad I did because you narrate it. And so that humor and style really comes through. One of the themes of the book and really of your life story is own your own narrative. Um, don't let others control your story, that it's yours. I think a lot of leaders really struggle to embrace the the authenticity of who they are. They might try to show up as different people in different places. Um, and you talk a lot about that. I wonder if you could share about your own journey and the lessons that you've learned um, and how that might inform your leadership style, which obviously has resonated with so many people, not just locally, but you know, around the world. Sure. So, you know, when I wrote uh, Burn the Page in the first place, I really wanted to get that narrative out of, you know, casting fires to stories you don't want to be in anymore. And one of the best ways to do that is to tell the, your story. It's not like you have to write the most salacious thing in the world 
You know, I always say like, like drama queens have a place and it's on RuPaul's Drag Race. They do not belong, you know, in every other you know aspect of society here where you're just like, oh, my God, look what a mess I am. It's like, no, no, you, you don't need that. But in terms of, OK, what are other people going to use against you? What are the stories about you know who you are, where you've come from, where you've made mistakes, you've you, you've been flawed, you know, you've got things that you're not necessarily that proud of. Well, I would rather be the one who's telling that story than not having other people tell it. People try to this day still try to do that with me. I'm like, all right, it's, you know, it is what it is. I just accept it and I acknowledge it and move on. And what I think other leaders, or in this case, other influencers could have here um, for, you know, your audience is having, is enough, is if you have enough comfortability and confidence to be able to tell your story, you're going to be able to influence other people to want to do the same for themselves in only the way they can. And that's one of the crucial parts about this is remembering that we all share one thing in common, which is a first person perspective. And so anything else about your life is going to be based on observation. It is not going to be based on lived experience. You uniquely have that lived experience because you know what was going on in your head in those moments, assuming that you can remember those uh, moments, of course. Um, some moments are more clear than others. Um, you know, see uh, my 20s, which I wrote about rather in depth uh, in, uh, in Burden the Page. You know, it's uh, very uh, blunt and honest about you know, using alcohol as a security blanket, you know, for a good part of my 20s. You know, I was never an alcoholic, but I was definitely a social drinker and I was a party drinker at that. You know, and so we run heavy metal bands for 12 years and, you know, you lead a band that you uh, style as drunk thrash. Well, that's going to happen, right? So, you know, I was upfront, honestly. Like, yeah. They, these are stories of my life, you know, put it out there. And at the same time, my constituents to date, they're like, you know what? I might not be able to relate with every part of your story here, but I do relate with your honesty. I do relate with your authenticity. And, oh, I'm sure I will be uh, seeing a ton of mailers and TV ads or digital ads or whatever else uh, used against me later this year uh, based entirely on the book or other things. Okay. You know, election day is 20 weeks from today is what it is you know i just i just accept him like okay well while you all talk about that that's fine i will go and talk about fixing roads and feeding kids i think your approach there obviously you've been inspirational to a number of um folks in the lgbtq community who see wow you know they've been told you can't be who you are and be a leader or get elected and you've proven them wrong but i think it's also inspirational for any leader, for someone to say, you know, people told me I couldn't be who I was and get here. And guess what? I did it. I proved them wrong. You mentioned in your book, the um, 13th um, district, it's not exactly West Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, we're talking suburban Virginia. Um, and you found a way to connect with your community. And not everybody agrees with you on every single issue but that doesn't mean that they don't put their faith in you. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think there's such a leadership lesson there for anyone, no matter whether they're running for office or they're running a business. Um, so the first part here is that people just made a bunch of wild assumptions who don't live here. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is always so charming to me when I hear people from way outside the district who have never stepped foot in Manassas Mass Park, Haymarket or Gainesville, try to opine about what it is that my constituents want or need, where it's just like, y'all, until you spend a day having your soul sucked out of you on I-66, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> like until you've had a day where you have hit your head on the steering wheel because Route 28 is backed up at 2.30 in the afternoon and you're just like, oh my God, I'm just trying to pick up my kid to go home. You know, like, like, I, I, I don't need to hear it. One of the other, like, I, I hear a lot of stupid things from people who don't live here. Oh, my God. Janica Rome is going to have such a hard time relating to Latino and Hispanic constituents in such a uh, heavily Latino and Hispanic area because she doesn't speak Spanish and because she's transgender and they're socially conservative and blah, blah, blah. They'll say that stuff. I'm like, OK, um, have you ever spent a day knocking doors with me? in my heavily Latino Hispanic neighborhoods and talking to people about their commute 
and talking to people about Medicaid expansion and talking to people about making sure that we are fully funding our schools and making sure that we are raising teacher pay and making sure that we're taking care of their day-to-day -day quality of life issues and that I voted to do a lot of things that are entirely in line with my constituents' values. And then, oh my God, you're now assuming that all of them are gonna just be transphobic bigots because, oh Jesus, how are they ever gonna relate to the trans woman? And it's just like, because I had a conversation with them at their door and they're like, okay, cool, you're from here, so am I, neat. Or, hey, you're from here, great, I just moved here. What should I, what should I need to know about getting around here? Like, well, um, I got a bunch of res restaurant recommendations if you want one, to, you know? It's just like, politics, just like journalism, politics is a people business. You get out there and you communicate. It's what you do. I spent 10 and a half years in newsrooms writing news stories, but it, most of my time I did not spend in the newsroom. I spent out in the field. You know, just that's the, the other thing that's important is go out there and just talk to people. People are people. And look, you know, I've got a certain number of my voters are Republican voters, by the way, and I can prove it in the data. In 2021, uh, when all three Democrats lost statewide, uh, they lost two precincts in my district on election day itself. This excludes early voting um, that I won. I won Tyler precinct and I won the second precinct of Manassas Park when the Democrats top of the ticket all lost. How come I, as transgender delegate, was able to outrun three straight people at the top of the ticket? And it's just like, because my constituents know who I am. I'm plugged in. I'm, I sat at Haymarket Town Council meetings for nine years, bored out of my skull until they exploded at each other and cussed each other out and stuff. And I got to write about it on the front page of the newspaper. Like, <laughs> like I know every inch of Washington Street in the town of Haymarket, even though it's a half hour drive from where I live. It's like, well, you know, I have spent so much time in every aspect of, you know, every, all 18 of my current uh, precincts and throughout in the, the state census I'm running for, all throughout the city of Manassas, city of Manassas Park and Western Prince William in general, I'm not coming across new turf. I'm not coming across somewhere where it's like, geez, I don't know what I'm gonna talk about here in Northern Haymarket today in Northern Gainesville and Cat Harp and what are people gonna possibly want to hear from me? This is all gonna be new. I better use just standard issue stuff. No, we're gonna talk about the same stuff I talk about every other, like, I know the communities already. I've lived here my entire life. And so they're, they're, one thing that I think for your audience in terms of being influencers, remember to go with your gut, a well-informed gut, but just like, what do you think people want to talk to you about? And it's just like the, the things that are important to you, right? So for me, hey, raising the standard deduction, that's a great thing to talk about. It affects a lot of people. Or maybe if I'm in Manassas, I'll talk about raising the earning from a tax credit, making that more refundable helps out a lot of people you know when you talk i have never heard at the doors someone who has criticized me for my vote for expanding medicaid even if they live in the most wealthy mcmansion parts of my district not a single one of those people has ever told me you know danica i'm so disappointed that you voted to make sure other people have health insurance it that never happens and so it's just like you know what be yourself as you go do this. Trust your instincts on this to some extent and just make sure that they're well informed. And that's my instincts come from, you know, you spend the better part of a decade recovering the news in your lifelong home community. Chances are you start figuring out what, what's important to people. I love that line. Trust your gut. But the caveat, well informed gut. <laughs> yeah, trust your well informed gut. Yeah, make sure you drink a lot of kombucha. Good for your gut. <laughs> yeah, because you're out there. Uh, you know, I just loved reading about like knocking doors and leaving the personal notes and that focus. If we, I was so interested in your background in heavy metal and how that really inspired you. And one of the stories that you told was about um, Metallica and how they connect with fans after their concerts. Can you just share that? Because that was an anecdote that really stuck with me. And then it seemed to, um, you know, it, it, obviously it's something that influenced you as you thought about how to connect with. Yeah, it's funny is that I got asked about this once by Joe Garofoli at the San Francisco Chronicle who asked me uh, because Metallica is from the Bay area, you know? And so um, he actually asked me about this uh, before. So yeah, I'm happy to relay that. So yeah. So one of the things to talk about and burn the page um, 
when I was in high school, um, there was a um, behind the music uh, episode on VH1 uh, about Metallica. And one of the things um, that I remember did basically like this uh, PR person from Electra Records was talking about was, you know, it doesn't matter how tired they are, you know, after a show, if there's still kids out there, there's still people out there who want an autograph, they'll sign every autograph, they'll take every picture, blah, 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 that whole thing, right? And that work ethic is something I wanted to bring into politics with me. And so that I remember my first year in office when I was still super cool for like a year. <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, yeah, those 15 minutes expire real fast. And so, you know, back then I, I would have, you know, I would do, I, I would do a lot of um, public speaking and have people lined up for like two hours afterwards to, to talk to me. And especially at my alma mater at St. Bonaventure that had that happen, you know, I had that happen out West and here in the district, people don't need to have two hours of waiting in line. Cause like, I'll go to your house. <laughs> like I do a lot of house calls here. So it's just like, if you're my constituent, yeah, just call me. I'll come over. That's cool. <laughs> so, um, I remember just, um, in, in one case, um, I had gone out West after my 2017 campaign was over and, um, I had a really long rope line, talked to a lot of people. And this one guy, he was an older fella. He was sitting down, sucks my campaign manager. And um, he extended his two hands out toward me. And, you know, I just talked to a whole lot of people. And I'm going to make time for this one, one more person, right? Sure, no problem. He's, you know, he couldn't get up into the line. or I didn't think he could get up, but it turns out. But um, he was shaking his hands out toward me. And so I, I, I went out to shake his hand. He clasped his hands around mine. And he goes, these hands touched Harvey's. He's talking about Harvey Milk's. And he told me these stories where we started walking through um, the Castro and he pointed to a hill down the street and he said, during the height of the AIDS crisis, he's like, my friends were dying right here on the street. They were 25 years old, looking like they were 85. And it was just, it was so surreal listening to him describe how like half the people that he knew at one point were dying or right in this area and why he wanted to share that with me, you know, and why that was important to him is even though I, I'm definitely a different person than who Harvey Milk was and, you know, Harvey certainly had his flaws too, by the way, it's not like, you know, sugarcoat that, but I do want to say that like the basic message of, of coming out, the best message of the power of, of influence in this case, where when you are out, you are encouraging other people to live authentically as well, because they're seeing your representation, they're seeing your example, and they can say, hey, if Dan can, can do this, so can I, right? That message is something that's really important. And he saw a continuation of that message to me, you know? decades after Harvey's assassination. And, you know, the, this is not going to be something where I'm going to, you know, put my head on my ass and be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the second coming art milk or something. No, no, I'm, I'm myself. And part of that <clears throat> is just recognizing that someone was so moved that he wanted to share a story about that. And all, in a way, you talk to your LGBTQ elders and they're like, just remember on your worst days here, how hard it was to even get to this place, right? You know, for me to be in a position of viability, this damn well was impossible 10 years ago. You know, I know that. I'm well aware of that. This absolutely would have been unheard of 20 years ago. And I would have probably been assaulted 30 years ago. You know, you've talked a lot about how to influence your you know, constituents and the public and how that starts with letting them influence you, you know, to what's important to them and, and listening and those skills you learned as a reporter. Um, something else that I'm really interested in is how you've been able to find ways to work with uh, other elected officials across the aisle who you might not agree with on a lot of stuff. You shared in the book that, you know, your mom is really conservative and you had a point of view about how you find ways to have common ground with people you don't agree with on everything, and also how you even go travel to the districts of some of the Republican legislators you're trying to work with. Can you talk about 
that style of how you influence those that you need to cooperate with and what you've so, learned from your first term to now have, you know, you're in your third term. Um, because again, I think there are a lot of lessons for leaders who have to influence other leaders as part of their work. So when you know what it's like to be the only person like you in every room that you enter, you have to show a lot of grace to people who either do have good intentions, but don't express them well, or um, are have malicious intent. And they don't like what you represent. They don't like you. They don't, they don't think that your values align with theirs. And at the same time, there's going to be of the thousands of bills that come up, there's going to be things that you agree on. <laughs> and so you have to remember bill to bill to bill to bill that, hey, this person who I don't agree with today, I might need their vote on something else another time, right? And you're going to have to initiate these conversations. I've absolutely got, got people in the Virginia General Assembly who, <clears throat> we'll just put it this way. Uh, if I won my next election and they didn't, I, I wouldn't lose any sleep. It's just fine. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. You know, I've also got people who I really, really, really hope come back, you know, this uh, next year because I, I have phenomenal working relationships with them on both sides of the aisle, by the way, you know, like got plenty of that. It's like, sure. Would I love to see 140 Democrats, you know, in the general assembly? Sure. Of course. Those days are long gone. The democratic party used to have that sort of dominance in Virginia and, you know, the much more when they were conservative, you know, the conservative Democrat states, the Dixiecrat states, those days are long gone. So in the modern day here, you've got to find the grace within yourself to be able to have a conversation with someone who, you know, disagrees with you on things that are very important to you. It doesn't mean you stop fighting. It doesn't mean that you don't stand up for your values. It doesn't mean that when you were working on compromises on some things that you're going to compromise your integrity. No, it means you got to be a good legislator. <laughs> you know, what's so funny is uh, the, the movie Lincoln was shot in the Virginia House of Delegates chamber. A lot of people don't know that, uh, by the way. So it's, it's really funny because uh, Tommy Lee Jones's character, I remember watching that um, because I had not seen that before I was in office. And I was watching that and I texted um, my colleague, uh, Delegate Don Adams. And I said, Don, he sits in your seat on the house floor. And she's like, yeah, I know. I know. Isn't that so cool? But um, one of the things that you really take away um, from that movie that is based on real life is that people forget that when they really over the top glorify uh, Abraham Lincoln as this, you know, large in life you know, person, he was a politician at the end of the day, right? He, he was a deal maker. <laughs> he still had to figure out how do you work with people who disagree with you? How do you, how do you bring them into the fold? to get them to agree on something that's still really important. And that was one of the things I thought was so interesting with that portrayal uh, was basically the idea of like, hey, look, even these people who were absolutely, you know, in the American Zeitgeist for um, exemplary leadership and all the things that come with it. It's like, yeah, peel that onion back. And then you find out, oh, right. Remember, he was elected. He had to run for office. He had to do all these things to try to appeal to the most number of people and stay true to himself while trying to do that. Right. And you're like, oh, hey, some of that's relatable. And at the same time, you get there and you want to do something that is you know, fundamentally going to alter the course of world history in terms of the abolition of slavery. How do you get there with the votes to get the constitutional amendment in the first place? especially when you're dealing with a lot of people from the other party. There's a lot of deal making you got to do, right? There's a lot of compromise. There's a lot of ways you got to talk about it. And this this gets into the sausage making part of legislation, right? Where it's like, no one likes to see a sausage being made and no one likes to see how legislation is made. But it doesn't always have to be, uh, maybe the best way to put it is when I got there, by default, this, the process was not as inherently terrible, awful as you might think it is most of the time. Sometimes, and this happened this year, and I'll even call it out, the bill that we all voted, all but one of us voted for, um, to, which was, we would call the Dominion Bill, which was basically to restore a lot of oversight, you know, government oversight and such. Oh, my God, the legislative process that produced this bill 
was a heaping pile of garbage that produced a decent bill. I hated the process for that. I, uh, behind the scenes, fumed about the process for it. And when it came time to vote for it, I had to ask myself, what's the greater good? Is the greater good going to be to hit the no button out of a protest for a process that I think was uh, completely, utterly anti-transparent? That was the definition of backroom deals. That was everything else that I thought was disgusting about politics. Or do I look at the text and the words that are on the paper after this process has come forward and I am voting on the text that it comes before us? That's a decision I had to make, right? And sometimes this is going to be one of those where you can try to take the highest of moral high grounds and realize that if you get this vote wrong, that it's going to do more damage than good for people. Or you can vote the other way and realize that the process that produced this is antithetical to a lot of things that you stand for, quite frankly, but the product itself is what's on the board. When we, when you go to hit that green light or red light, or you hit that request to speak button, you got to remember that you're looking up and you were here to talk about something that is going to direct that the words in front of you are what will directly affect the people you represent, whereas the process that produced those words is something that you can reform long term within the legislative process, but it's not going to affect the day to day lives of the people you represent because it's done. It's over. You now have a product that's been produced for you. Here it is. Yeah. So I think in terms of leadership on this, you, there comes a point in this line of work where you go, I can be really frustrated at a lot of things. And I have to always remember what's the greatest good. Mm. Sometimes a bad process produces bad bills and you should call out all of that stuff and then vote no. Absolutely. Sometimes a bad process produces a mediocre bill where you're like, I'm going to vote no on this today because this should be better. My constituents deserve better than this. Okay, if, that, if that's what happens. But here, let me tell you another one. Last year, we had a vote on the gas on uh, on repealing um, the grocery tax. Grocery tax is inherently regressive, no question. Inherently regressive tax would be happy to repeal it, and yet a portion of the grocery tax was dedicated to transportation. Specifically, fifty three percent of it was dedicated towards maintenance for transportation. We're talking about one hundred ninety million dollars over two years. At a time where we had, in 2022, we would have more than 1,000 people die on Virginia roadways. In 2021, we had 968 people die on Virginia roadways. And from the grocery tax, they're talking about making the localities whole. They're going to you know, uh, sub, you know, supplant some of the funding that they were otherwise going to be losing from this. They were talking about making sure education was whole. Okay, but how about transportation? Oh, well, we have transportation surplus. We're going to use this transportation surplus to cover this. Bull. There is no such thing as a transportation surplus when we have $47 billion of outstanding demand just in nine jurisdictions in Northern Virginia alone. You cannot possibly say this. And at a time where you all haven't fixed the very freaking roads that are killing my constituents right now after I've been yelling hard and screaming about this for years. And so what ended up happening is I stood on the House floor and I asked, did you all make transportation funding hole? No, because we have transportation surplus. If you have transportation surplus, how come Rollins Ford Road isn't fixed? How come Route 28 is fixed? Oh, well, uh, like, yeah, then there is no transportation surplus. I railed on this through a royal epic fit on the House floor on that bill and on a bill uh, that would have temporarily repealed the gas tax, which would have been a disaster for Virginia in terms of making sure that our roads are well maintained and keeping people safe. It would have been like the the re the return you're talking about like eleven dollars return to but that would otherwise cost people probably get people killed like more people killed than who are already getting killed. I threw a epic fit about these. And on, when it came to on that one vote on the grocery tax, knowing fully well that they were going to gut $190 million in transportation funding and my constituents sent me to Richmond to get more transportation funding, that was antithetical to my values, even though the result would have been, hey, getting rid of the grocery tax sounds good. 
I am the only legislator from either party in either chamber who voted against it repeatedly because I will not defund transportation, period. I won't do it. Not not to tune in nine digits. Absolutely not. It goes against my values. That was a hard vote to cast. I'm going to get hit in the face this year over the next 20 weeks because of that vote. I know that's coming. I am well aware that I am playing with fire on a bill that was going to pass no matter what I chose to do. It was so against my conscience. I could not in good faith and look at myself in the mirror and say, I did the best job for my constituents and I did the best job for the Commonwealth because I voted to defund transportation. Get out. Absolutely not. And so sometimes you have to take that hard vote if for no other reason than to know that you did the right thing for the right reason. Yeah. It's And so I showed you between those two bills, one where you got to make a compromise in terms of like, oh, this process is terrible, but the end result is OK versus the process is terrible. And actually, in that case, the process wasn't the problem. In that case, the argument for the process was the problem because they were arguing something that was fundamentally not true, which is a supposed transportation surplus. You can, if you underfund transportation and then magically you have more tax receipts coming in, you go, oh, there's a surplus. That's because you're not spending enough on transportation projects to begin with. So yeah, surprise with. So I hope these examples of nothing else show you that you've got to consider a lot of this stuff, you know, issue to issue. And at the same time, you do have to pick your battles. And I picked my battle. The battle that I picked on the Dominion bill was to sort of fit about it behind the scenes. And then when the time came, you know, and I saw that it did more uh, good than harm, I voted for it. And then on the uh, grocery tax one where it is against every ounce of my being to defund transportation, I'm willing to take the hit on it because there's not a chance in hell that I think that, you know, we should have less money for fixing our roads, bridges, pedestrian paths, bicycling lanes, everything else that we need. And so, you know, I know I did the right thing for the right reason. In addition to those examples of uh, kind of legislative battles, you've, you know, had a lot of success at getting bills you know, passed and signed and you've cooperated across the aisle. I just want to ask you, kind of taking a step back, I think a lot of leaders really struggle with, um, you know, imposter syndrome. I think the imposter syndrome can be the enemy of influence because if you don't believe you can have influence, it's hard to exert it. And when I think about your story, uh, you know, you were working two jobs. You were working at Afghan Kebab House and as a journalist at the same time. While you were doing that, you were advocating for changes to policy at the school district. Um, Then you're touring on a shoestring budget in Scotland with. uh, That was a couple of years before, but yeah, that that was a different time that I had two full time jobs, but yes. (laughs) And so, you know, whether it's when you have those two full time jobs or whether it's when you're, you know, performing with Cab Ride Home. I just, it, it strikes me, you didn't imagine yourself battling out legislation the way you are and influencing public policy or um, having the national recognition that you have and, you know, being invited by celebrities to come to events. How did you, you talk about the imposter syndrome a little bit. I don't remember if you use those words exactly, but you even kind of had a joke about overcoming your inner Ralph Wiggum. And so can you share a little bit about the lessons that you've learned in overcoming those doubts, because I think no matter what industry a leader is in, everybody's run into yeah. that. And that can really keep you from having the influence you want to have and making the impact you want to so see. So I would say more so than imposter syndrome for me, I, it was doubts, right? Okay. It's it's doubts of, can I win? That's the first thing is, can I win? Because all the policy things you want to accomplish as a legislator, you don't mean anything if you don't win. <laughs> You know, you can be the advocate, you can do all that stuff, but you wouldn't be running for office if that was the end goal. You're running for office to win an election and so you can go and serve people. That's that's the point. And so that's the first one is, can I win? And then once you get there, can I get my bill passed? Can I get this done? And that's, um, those are questions where, yeah, you can have a lot of doubts when you're first, when you're, you know, when you're the first person who's like you there, because when I found myself in the minority party, my first uh, two years, they weren't inclined to do me any favors. They killed all my bills my first year. They put me on the kill list, just straight up, just like, nope, we don't want you. To, we don't. We're not. We don't want you to be here. So we're not going to do you any favors. And you know, I worked my way 
off the kill, it's like we talked about earlier by, you know, visiting uh, Republicans in their districts and, you know, really, really you know, working with Bill Sparty in the off session. Um, but what I what I found was some of my colleagues have told me directly that they have imposter syndrome over it. And I have to remind them of their qualifications, why they're there and that they are there because tens of thousands of people in some of their cases voted to put them there because they thought that they, you know, that they belonged. And, you know, I remember when I got to the hotline, uh, you know, um, for our national journal in December, 2009, here I am coming from, you know, St. Bonaventure University, three years removed. I'm coming from, you know, just reporting for my local weekly newspaper and I'm applying for a job against hundreds of other people where my colleagues, at the hotline, some of them had gone to Harvard. Some of them had worked on statewide campaigns, presidential campaigns, whatever. Some of them had been these like incredible reporters and stuff. And here's me coming from a high school girls gymnastics meet, you know, and, you know, covering like a wine tasting one day and then, you know, town council another day or general assembly or you know even Congress stuff. And I was just like, holy crap, how the hell did I get here? I was not a particularly good student. I made the dean's list two out of eight semesters when I was in college. Uh, and the last time I had been on the honor roll was third grade. Not like, you know, I was it's like, how did I get here? It's like, well, remember from that time that you were in college and you would read about politics two hours a day, every single day, seven days a week. And you did that for... Oh, say at that point, five, six years in a row every day. That's why you're here, because you took such an interest in this and you read up on it and you do know a lot about this. And yeah, when you apply yourself, you're a damn fool. You're actually a good reporter, but you have to apply yourself. That's part of it. And then fast forward eight years later, running for office. You know, it's just like, yeah, when you apply yourself, when you actually go out and knock doors, when you actually go and make those phone calls, when you actually put yourself in front of other people, you're good at this. But you have to go and do it. Get off your ass and go out and knock some doors today. Get off your ass and go, you know, make some phone calls or hell, you can be seated for that part if you want to. But I'm also a pacer when I'm on the phone. I like to walk. <laughs> so like just like, um, like lots of uh, lots of uh, pen of energy. So. You know, I, I think part of part of this, just to, to put the wrap around it, is the doubts I had were about taking the initiative and consistently doing it every day, like clockwork, to make sure that I was doing the things I needed to do to win. And I'll tell you, in that first campaign, and I write about this in the book, so I kicked off that campaign in a 92 Dodge Shadow that was worth $324 at the time. I bought it for 700 bucks in 2012. You know, it's colored with primer blue. It was in primer and blue. It had more rust than paint. And I that car had, for since 2012, bit it. I kicked off my campaign January 3rd of 2017. The car was dead by February. So I replaced it with a $1,500, 98 Toyota Camry. That car bit it by April. And I was just like, oh, man, primaries in June. What am I going to do? I can't. I'm not raising enough money to be able to afford a rental car right now. Or at least not until the next act blue check comes in. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, my God. And so I did the only thing I could do. Got on my bike and I started knocking doors in my home precinct in the woods, mind you, where it's a zoned SR one to five. So you're talking one to five acre, you know, lots. And there's no sidewalks, no sidewalk, sidewalks in Yates Fort. Mm -mm. That means that you are hustling. And when you're looking for Democratic primary voters, sometimes you got to go half mile between doors. And... I did bike for two days that chafed. And so then I just walked. I walked for six days out in the woods, dirt roads, off dirt roads, off of dirt roads, looking for to go knock on doors. And one little thing I could afford for three bucks over at CVS is a little stack of four by six um, uh, uh, pieces of paper. And you just rip off the top. And I would leave a personalized handwritten note every single door I went to with my personal cell phone number. Six years later, I've won three campaigns. Uh, today is primary day in Virginia. I don't have a primary opponent, so, you know, a Democratic nominee. I still do that to this day, six years later. I still write that note, whether I'm knocking doors in Bullroom Mobile Home Community Park, you know, basically trailer park. I'll write, I'll leave the exact same note over there 
that I leave out in the previously mentioned McMansions or the townhouses or the two over twos or the single family house or the townhouse or the apartments or the condos. I don't care. I'll talk to everyone the same way. Everyone gets the same amount of dignity. And that, you know, what I, what I got out of that, that hustle, I won my home precinct in a four-way primary where I was being outspent by tens of thousands of dollars by two different candidates. I'm being outmailed two to one. I won my home precinct by more than 20 points, 54 and a half percent of the vote. And then my next door, my other home precinct, that was the top of my street, uh, one side is home precinct, the other side is the other precinct, you know, and quarter mile walk from the from my house to the top of the precinct at least when i was living there and um i won the other precinct with like 53 percent of the vote hmm. i and in a four-way primary that's 20 plus point victories you know what i mean that happened because i willed it into existence i was not going to let you know this problem prevent me from winning and from doing what i need to do and when in and, you know, the, one of the best pieces of advice I got from the 2015 Democratic nominee for the 13th district, he told me there's never been a candidate who won election day, who lost an election and said, I wish I knocked fewer doors. Right. That's great. I mean, I just, the hustle, the hustle comes through and it came through in the book. I, with our time, I just want to ask you one last question. You've been talking a lot about the in-person interaction with your constituents and with your peers in the legislature. Um, on social media. I think a lot of leaders have a love-hate relationship with social media because, you know, it can be time-consuming. It can attract critics and trolls, but at the same time, it can be used to connect and inspire others really efficiently and at scale. So I wonder if you could just share a little bit about your own approach to social media. My approach to social media, a few things. So the first thing I'll, I'll say on this is when you go to my Twitter page, I'm at PWC Danica. Um, right now, the top two things that you'll see on there is uh, me talking about trains and talking about feeding goods. Turns out the transportation uh, school lunch lady is all about feeding, feeding roads, feeding get, or, or fixing roads, feeding goods. We've passed 41 of my bills into law, all with bipartisan support, including 12 feet under kids. And I talked about you know, the money secured for fixing around for road, Route 28 earlier, big advocate for expanding mass transit. And you know why? When you got, you know, 95,700 Twitter followers, you're talking about where people can go find uh, free school meals or free summer meals today at Garfield High School in Woodbridge. And now it's going to come over to Unity Reed High School in Manassas uh, next week. And you know, why expanding Amtrak service uh, east to west, um, you know, from Roanoke is good for the rest of Virginia because uh, it actually takes more traffic off of I-81, which will then take more traffic off 66, 95, blah, blah, I, I write about that because two things. Number one, a good number of those people who follow me are going to be my constituents. And so it's just an easy way to, con to go communicate with them. And then for people who are outside of the district, you know what they do? They look at this and you're like, Man, I wish my legislator talked about this because my legislator is just like talking about like Trump based conspiracy stuff or, you know, stupid crap. And they're not just telling you about what's going on at home today and dealing with those like day to day real life issues. And look, on my, my social media, I got a sense of humor, too. You know, I try to put that out, out there. You know, I, I, you know, I talk about my love of heavy metal. I talk about, you know, other stuff that makes me a person. Um, but I try to really spend a lot of the time that I write, you know. I use a lot more, I use a lot more um, either neutrality or um, uplifting uh, style of communication than I do negative. It's not that I don't do negative. I certainly do just as, you know, you know, sometimes negative things happen and you got to get pissed about it. You know, that's part of the deal, right? Uh, it's part of being human. And so, yeah, you know, I certainly communicate that as well. And, you know, I, I make sure that what I do with my Twitter page especially is I communicate to my constituents, number one, and by communicating well to my constituents, I'm telling this, you know, this national audience that I have, hey, this is, you followed me, chances are you followed me, not for my uh, stance about why we need to replace cast iron water pipes with ductile iron pipes, even though we do. Um, Chances are water infrastructure isn't the reason that you were following my uh, my page. You might be following me because I'm trans. That's a good lot of people, right? 
and not but and yeah, you're following me as I'm trans and I'm a trans legislator, which means I'm going to talk a lot about legislative stuff, about my district, about policy things. And I'm going to talk about trans things here and there as well, um, because, hey, my constituents, some of them are also trans, which means that it's constituent service. Quality is constituent service. You know, that's why supporting LGBTQ you know, constituents is part of the job as far as I'm concerned. So what I would tell other people about social media with this is just to make sure, number one, you're using your authentic voice. Uh, and if communicating is hard for you, that's okay. Everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. Just make sure that whoever is running your social media is able to capture your voice and that it's consistent with the message that you would bring to the doors. It's consistent with the message that you would bring in whatever chamber of public service that you're in. Love that. Danica Rome, we are so um, happy that you joined us today for Chief Influencer. Whether folks are Democrats or Republicans or even pay attention to politics at all, I hope that they will read your book and I hope they will pay attention to you and take away some of the great lessons that you shared with us today about influence, starting with letting your constituents or the people around you influence you. And I love that you said, uh, go with your gut, but a well-informed gut. That's such an important uh, part of overcoming doubt, of overcoming uh, imposter syndrome if folks deal with that. And influencing others to achieve the impact that you want in your communities in the world, um, whether that's improving the infrastructure of transportation like Route 28, or making sure that other folks who are part of the LGBTQ community know that they can overcome the naysayers. And they yeah, and, and the last them. thing to leave you all with, remember, there's no white knight coming down Route 28 on horseback ready to save the day. We are the people who are we're looking for it's like it, it's us there's no one else coming we have to be the ones who are going to step up into those positions of leadership instead of just counting on other people to fill that it's us if we don't who else is and so i would just encourage people to remember to take the initiative go be your best self be who you are be that well and thrive because of who you are not despite it and not for what other people tell you you're supposed to be powerful message to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you so kindly. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Chief Influencer, a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board. If you know a leader who should be featured as a chief influencer, please nominate them at chiefinfluencer.org. For show notes and more, visit us at chiefinfluencer.org or follow Chief Influencer on LinkedIn. Until next time, 